Greeting to all in our Maple Grove United Church congregation and beyond those who are joining us for this virtual service. Thanks to YouTube and the technical work of El Weibo and J.C. Barabay, we're able to offer online worship as we continue to provide worship services during this time of COVID-19. Thank you to everyone who continues to support our ministry and mission and our United Church Mission and Service Fund by PAR, that's pre-authorized remittance, or by mailing in your offering to our church office or through Canada Helps. By pressing that button on the bottom of our website, your contribution goes automatically. You get notice of that and a receipt within minutes. Thanks to those who have also been able to help Kerr Street Mission during this difficult time. And thanks as well to others who are finding many alternative ways to support one another in our community of faith during these unsettling days. I so miss seeing you and chatting with you. I look forward to when we can again be in one another's presence. Now, let us prepare to enter into God's presence this day in heart, mind, and spirit as we listen to our prelude. Consolation number three by Litz.
the call to worship. Welcome with open arms fellow believers who don't see things the way you do. Even when it seems they are strong on opinions but weak in the faith department. Remember, they have their own history to deal with. Treat them gently. Opening prayer. Oh Jesus, help us. Make it our joy to study you, meditate on you, and sit like Mary at your feet. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Give us faith. Amen. And now we'll sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, number 664 from Voices United. Scripture reading is Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 to 21. Joseph forgives his brothers. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. 
In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Glory be to God. The Bible verse today is from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment onto those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgments on the servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one, some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord, and those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. Since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord, and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. When we, when we die, we die to the Lord. So then whenever we live or whenever we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother and sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Thank you. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, my strength and my redemption. Amen. Life is a mystery. Faith is a mystery. God is a mystery. We are living in strange times. We are riding on the remnants of the old normal and don't yet know what the new normal will be and when it will start to arrive and what it will mean for us. 
We are very limited in what we can control. We can follow the research and wear masks, physically distance, and wash our hands frequently. But even that might not be enough to protect us and the people we love from COVID-19. We are very limited in what we can control, not just now, but in every part of our lives. We couldn't choose who we were born to or the circumstances of the world when we were born. We arrived and had to figure it out over and over again. We had to find our paths and what we found meaningful in the way we chose to live. Now, in the time of COVID-19, many of us are trying to figure out our future paths while nothing is clear. We are, in effect, blindfolded. What COVID-19 makes clear to us is that life is a mystery, that we can't control or even predict what's next in our lives. We are living in important and chaotic times. COVID-19 also shows us the structures we have accepted blindly, unthinkingly. The essential workers we are dependent on we have just accepted being paid poorly. We can now see that we need a better, higher minimum wage with part-time work being paid and given benefits proportional to full-time. One of my friends worked in two long-time care homes because neither would give workers full-time hours and benefits. When COVID-19 arrived, she had to choose which place to work and lost a chunk of her income. Not fair. And as it turned out, not smart, as some of the COVID-19 infections had been transmitted by workers forced by low wages and deliberate part-time work to work in two different long-term care homes in order to make a living wage. And that had helped spread COVID-19. If too many poorly paid workers get sick in the farms, in the meat plants, on the roads, in the grocery stores, the daycares, and the schools, we are, all of us, in trouble. The shortages and the difficulties may well increase. As we move into whatever the new normal turns out to be, I pray it includes a more just distribution of the world's goods, a fairer sharing. Because being fairer and sharing, as Jesus exemplified for us with the story of the sharing of the loaves and fishes, by sharing fairer, we are actually protecting ourselves. Just as Canada's Medicare setup, while not perfect, at least protects all of us by helping the poorest of us get health care when needed, and thus helps keep all of us healthier and the economy running better. Life before and after, and definitely during COVID-19, is a mystery where we don't know what will happen and we can't control it. We can only keep on going and hoping, reaching out to each other, physically distanced, and for each other, as we need each other, and like the hymn says, we need our friend in Jesus, which leads us to the mystery of faith. Greater than the mystery of life is the mystery of faith. What is faith? I don't believe it has to mean believing the stories from the Bible are literally true. I don't believe it's understanding exactly what Christianity is and following all the rules. I don't believe it's thinking that you will get what you want by praying. I do believe it's not a connection just through our minds and our desires, but rather a deep and sometimes unrecognized connection through our hearts and our whole being. 
In many ways, faith is rather like love. It can be filled with wonder and delight, like love. It can fill you with trust and comfort, like love. But also like love, faith can be filled with anger and make you feel wretched. It's a bond, a connection, and you can't control it. Like love, it can rise without you seeking it and continue even when you'd rather end it. And with difficult faith, as with messed up love, it's your response that is important. No matter what state your faith is in, if you continue the conversation, whether in delight or anger or despair, that's still faith. It's the accepting of that spiritual need flowing out of your very being. It's continuing the conversation, like Jacob wrestling all night beside the river he'd crossed on his way home to the brother he had betrayed. It's trying to flee the connection like Jonah and finding yourself in a whale of trouble and unable to leave. As long as you're not indifferent, that's faith. The faith we need and experience changes over our lifetime, in my opinion. Faith changes as we go through the different stages of our lives. And different people at different times experience and express their faith differently, as Paul described in the reading from Romans. We need, according to Paul, to accept our own needs and position on faith and accept and respect others' positions and needs in their faith. As children, we perhaps experience the wonder of the stories in our tradition from the Bible. Perhaps we joyfully sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so and felt like we were accepted as part of something important. We sang, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. And we're introduced to anti-racism anti -racism, long before the term was invented. As teens, different parts of our brains develop. And as we are being taught to use critical thinking in schools, we start thinking differently. At that stage in my life, I began to have questions and differences with what was then commonly accepted as Christian requirements. Back then, it was another strange, disruptive time. Our generation were the children of parents who had suffered through the Depression and survived the Second World War. What our parents wanted was order and normality. But deep in their subconscious minds were the traumas and horrors of wartime. We youth were overwhelming in numbers, and with the arrogance and energy of young adulthood, we rejected as much of their world as we could. During my childhood, my teenage rebellion, and my young adulthood, I experienced faith differently. Childhood wonder and unquestioning faith had moved on to the individuation and rebellion that is part of being a teenager and a young adult. Some of my generation left the church in anger, some in indifference, and some to different forms of spiritual life, but some stayed or returned. For me, parenthood pulled me back. After a failed pregnancy, the wonder of pregnancy, even with all its physical wretchedness and the amazement of producing another independent living being out of my body from our bodies, reactivated awe in me and a different recognition 
of the importance of faith. I wanted to be seen in the world as a family. I wanted to know other families. I wanted to give our child our cultural inheritance, and that meant knowledge of the Bible for its moral content and for it as a source of literature and art. I wanted to be, needed to be, part of a community. And following my ancestors' path, church was the answer for us. Belonging to a church was a deep need, which in itself is a kind of faith. Attending church regularly actually brought my continuing doubt into prominence. I loved the stories and language of the Bible and couldn't stop attending. But I read a scripture one summer and read the verses the lectionary left out. It was King David on his deathbed, telling his son to kill men whom he had previously promised not to kill. I thought that was horrible for two reasons. One, he told his son to kill and to break his promise to these men. And two, the lectionary was structured to help David keep his status as a hero when he was very flawed. It made me feel I had been lied to and tricked. It made me very angry at the church. But I stayed and continued my ongoing faith conversation. Attending church regularly gave me a community, which meant I had to encounter other people. As more and I once discussed, we bring the messiest parts of ourselves to church. And my messiness sometimes engaged with others' messiness. Church politics are real and can be painful, and we have a choice. We can turn the other cheek and try to learn about ourselves and others, or leave. I chose to stay. That is a kind of faith. I spent a lot of my 35 years here feeling inadequate because I thought maybe I didn't believe the way I was supposed to, judging myself and assuming I was judged. But I stayed. And when a scary older woman approached me one coffee hour and said in a strong and loud voice, that she used to wonder why I let my then teenage daughter color her hair bright pink, I shriveled internally. Bad mom, bad mom. But that she had realized that Merle was here every week and that she was good with the little ones. Oh, she accepts Merle and us. And my sense of belonging to Maple Grove grew. That's community and community supports faith. Still, I kept looking for a place within the church where I could talk about my doubt and faith struggles. So I helped build a small discussion group. It was a relief to speak about my experiences of faith and doubt and still be accepted. When Michelle brought Centering Prayer to Maple Grove, I found the spiritual practice I needed the Christian practice of centering prayer. I meditated, often poorly and inadequately, but slowly I became more comfortable with my doubt, more comfortable with my compassion for myself and others, more able to just relax and enjoy my pleasure in the Bible and prayers and hymns and people around me. And that, I believe, is Christian self-acceptance and maturity, and the mystery of faith finally accepted. And the big mystery, the ultimate mystery, is God. I now believe that we humans trying to figure out and understand God are being short-sighted. We are being equivalent to the baby, grabbed away from fascinating, flickering, bright red and yellow flames, feeling that she knows what's best, not her parents. Time's about a million plus. 
We are incapable, I believe, of intellectually knowing God. I think we're able to get the tiniest hint of God's force and being through our hearts and through the people around us who are also struggling with and traveling the path of faith. Faith in God, I believe, is being able to simply accept the mystery of God. Joseph, in our scripture today, told his frightened brothers that he had no need of revenge on them for selling him into slavery because God had meant for him to be able to create a storage of food so that they would not starve. He was able to accept the mystery of something very good coming out of something very bad. What amazing compassion and faith in God. Joseph knew we can't know the mind of God as events happen, and we can't know what ultimately will come into being because of what feels like horrible circumstances. We need to not judge ourselves and others for the way we experience the wonder and compassion of faith that mysterious sense of God's presence. Whether we fight our faith, try to reject it, or glory in our connection with God, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, as long as we stay in the conversation, we have the gift of faith. Different times, different stages of our lives, we will interact with our spiritual faith in different ways. And that is how we learn and grow more richly and fully as spiritual human beings. Life is a mystery. Faith is a mystery. And God is a deep, deep, deep mystery. And we are all joined and all a part of our mysterious God. Thanks be to God. Let us close our eyes and open our hearts in prayer. O God, we thank you for all your gifts, for places we find beautiful, and homes where we can find some rest, and for meaningful work. We thank you for family and friends and people who greet us on the streets. We thank you for our comforts and our struggles, for time to worship our God and the technology that helps us maintain our human connections in this time of physical distancing. We are grateful. O Holy Spirit, Guide us and our communities, our country, and the people of our planet as we struggle through how to survive this pandemic, how to take steps to slow down climate change, and how to support leaders who don't just want power, but truly care for people. And Jesus, our teacher and guide, We thank you for the language of spiritual growth embedded in your stories and the stories that you passed on to us. They help us be awake to our spiritual selves. Now let us pray together the prayer given to us by Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, the hymn in the quiet curve of evening, number 278 in Voices United.
May the grace of Christ attend us and the love of God surround us and the Holy Spirit keep us now and ever. Amen. And now, go now in peace and then listen to the postlude. Oh.